Hello everyone, it is the Newsroom Podcast. I am joined by The Athletic's James Pearce. Um, before we dive into it, just a reminder, this show is brought to you in association with The Athletic. You can get 50% off your yearly subscription by going to theathletic.co.uk forward slash the Redmen TV. It's free for the first month as well and you get writing from the man I have with me in the studio right now. Um, James. Good to see you. Yes, good to have you in. Um I want to kick off, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the big stories that you, you've been covering for The Athletic in, 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 in recent weeks, uh, and we're going to go on later on to talk about the, the future of Liverpool's coaching staff, but um, I want to talk, talk to you about the, the routine, because obviously you've, you know, a, a regular on Red Men TV, we, we've, we've known each other for a number of years now, but we, we knew you formally as you know Liverpool's main man at the Liverpool Echo. Um, I'm quite interested because I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, because obviously as, as jobs shift and evolve and what have you. The big thing you you were telling me about it in the summer in the States was just like that change to the match day routine as much as anything else. You know, the lack of pressure, the the, the lack of needing to constantly, you know, to, to, to rush stories, to make deadlines, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's that change been like? Oh, it, yeah, it's been it's been great, to be honest. Um just just being able to take a step back and 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 kind of um and have more time. Uh, and space to to work on on stories. I think yeah, probably the, the match days is probably when you notice it more than any others because um, you know I think at the Echo um, you know it, it was a pretty grueling kind of thing where you you know you turn up, you're doing your video, you're doing your team news piece, you're writing into the live blog. You know you've got probably a half an hour after the final whistle to deliver a, a thousand word match verdict. Um, you're Which you're probably to, largely writing during. Yeah, the game. yeah, yeah. So that was the other thing. You like, you know, when people would say to me, "Did you even watch the game?" <laughs> I'd have to say, "You know what? No, not really," because I was I had my head down on the laptop for most of it. Um, so uh, and then obviously then you know dashing off to the mix zone and and all the rest of it. Um, and yeah, I think j- just not being not having those kind of stringent deadlines because obviously even though in the last few years at the Echo it's predominantly web based um it, there were still print deadlines you still had to meet so um yeah now with the athletic you kind of it's just very different because it's not really a match report you you're doing it's a you know it's a piece around the game really and um speak to the guys in the office down in London uh, in the build up to each game to kind of agree on a a general theme that and you can you know, try and go to the game really having already made a decent start and mm. if you're going to focus on a particular area of the team or a particular individual player. Um, and then, you know, for, for say, a, this weekend's against Leicester, um, you know, my deadline for, for filing that will be probably 10 a.m. Sunday. Um, so it just, it just gives you that. A, I think probably the benefit is at the game, you're able to spend more time actually speaking to people Um that that can be really helpful in a number of ways in terms of other stories that come up in the next few weeks, and then also obviously post game when you don't have those pressures, um, you, know, you can stay in the mix zone for that little bit longer um, and actually go away and hopefully produce a piece of work that that people are really interested in. It, it, it fascinates me because I'm sure because effectively in that regard you get into Anfield you're still in the press box you're still going through a very similar sort of like the the basics are, are the same. Does it do you, was there a wry smile when you see the likes of the lads who are still at the Echo and the print guys who are, who are legging around and you're casually strolling, hands in pockets, walking, presumably grabbing an extra cup of tea here and there? Yeah, I think it is. It has been strange actually because I used to even the stewards at Anfield had a word with me the other night because they were like, oh, "How come you finish so early?" You know, like, <laughs> because usually they're you know they're turning off the lights and the last yeah. ones they're ready to lock the door and. You know, Come on, Pierce, for God's sake, just <laughs> clear, clear off. Um, and uh, so, yeah, now that is a that is a bit different. I mean, obviously, you know, the, I suppose the other night was a case in point. When I mean, you've got a game like that, you know, and you see a lot of guys, you know, obviously battling against newspaper deadlines. And, you know, that was a bit of a nightmare the other night for, for people like that. When, you know, it looked like it was going to be an absolute cruise against Salzburg. Then you've got, oh, my God, you know, the European champions have fallen apart. Yeah. And then you've got another rewrite because they haven't. They've pulled it round and they've... And they've uh, they've won the game and got their defence up and running. So um, so yeah, it's 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 just been a, a a big change. But I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's um, you know a real difference. Obviously, working from home rather than um, being kind of tied to the office for eleven, twelve hours a day. And yeah. it's you know, going from maybe doing five or six stories a day to fill all the different web spikes at the Echo to to doing three or four a week. But you know those three or four have got to be you know you know well researched long reads that that give people information that they're not getting elsewhere because I think that's the the big thing when people are paying for content you know it's 
there's no there's no value in you know typing up every word from a Jurgen Klopp press conference because people can get that in yeah. thirty or forty other places. Yeah, I'm, I'm, what I'm interested in as well because they talk about in terms of football, and this is not, and this this might I guess could be read between the lines as a dig at the echo. It's not in any way, shape, or form. But I think the the, the way that the Athletic have recruited, you know, they've they've gone out and they've gone and got the the, the best and brightest in a, in a lot of instances from around uh, around the um, British media. And I noticed, because obviously you've done a, an article that's just come out, uh, I think it came out today or, or last night, uh, with Cy Hughes on Brendan Rodgers, and you've basically split it in, in, in two almost. Yeah. What does that? What impact has that had on, on you professionally? Because, as you say, you're going from, you're not really... Uh, I just think you're not really a journalist in those instances that you mentioned there. You are you're just fulfilling you're ticking boxes to some extent. You, you know, there's a there's a, a requirement of things that have to be out and they have to be out quick. There's no time for the art of it. You know, there's no time for to challenge yourself as a as a writer. There's no there's no need for flair or creativity in a lot of those things. Well all of a sudden, you know, you you you're working with alongside Simon Hughes, who is now multiple published author. We've probably got five of his books in this room a, a, a alone. And now you're, you know, your your writing style's going alongside him. Is it is it is it encouraging you to kind of challenge yourself a bit more in terms of a, as, as James Pierce the writer rather than just James Pierce the journalist? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and, and that, you know the knock on effect of that I think is more satisfying as well when you, you know when you are given that that extra amount of time. You know, I've spent two days this week as, essentially you know going back over all my notes from the, the Brendan Rodgers era and. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and digging all the, all of the old stuff out, and 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 actually compiling a piece, which you know, hopefully people will enjoy. I think yeah, well, I think it worked quite well working with Cy on it, where you know I said right, I'll take from kind of the day he took over to the summer of, of twenty fourteen. You take from there onwards, and um, yeah, and there's a you know a huge amount of detail in there, which you know if that was probably say three or four months ago if I was thinking of doing that I just it wouldn't have been realistic to you wouldn't have dedicate like, that amount of time to it it was the it's the quotes within it that actually I, I think because they they add a little bit of they just spice and flavor to it they, they yeah. really put you back in in, in the scene and I, it, those are the kind of things where you'd have paraphrased I mean look you, you obviously check your sources etc cetera, etc cetera, but you'd have probably paraphrased a bit more or you'd have said Rogers generally said along uh, along these lines because you're right you've not got the time to go back in and, and, yeah. and, and do it to quite that le- level of depth and detail yeah and um it's, it's fun. I'm really enjoying working with Cy Hughes. Obviously, you know we knew each other well previously, but um, you know I, I think hopefully we kind of complement each other quite well. I think we maybe come at things from from different angles as well. With um, you know in terms of contacts and backgrounds, and you know he, he's such a well-established, highly respected author, and mm-hmm. um, you know I'm, I'm kind of doing more of the day-to-day Liverpool stuff at the moment. He, he's got a bit of a wider remit in terms of the northwest, but. Um, yeah, it's you know it, it's uh, it's working out really well so far. Is there something in that? Because obviously, you, you, it's not necessarily as numbers driven as it, as it would have been in your pre- in your previous role. But are you given the numbers on it? You know, so in terms of like you go, well, look when you because you, you go on the Liverpool section of the Athletic website, and it's it obviously it's not just you and Cy Hughes when things cross over. Raf Hornstein's yeah. written a few things that are relevant to Liverpool, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there something in there where you're like? You want to be the you want to be the guy bringing the you know you know well you 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 know you're, you're benchmarking or, or whatever is there a, is there a competitive edge to come into it yeah uh, no no do you know what I, w- I wouldn't say there's a competitive edge no I mean we we you get there's, there's data available that that tells you basically how many people have read it read each of your stories um, but it, um, I'm not I, I don't, in your face I, using yeah. five thousand <laughs> more reads well no do you know what? I don't for, as far as I'm aware unless unless it's there and I haven't found it I don't think you can find out how many people have read other people's stories <laughs> um, but no there's no I don't no there's no competitive I I, I you know it's absolutely brilliant like earlier on this week um, you know I was thinking about maybe doing something on Sadio Mane ahead of you know him being reunited with Salzburg spoke to the desk and they said oh actually you know Rafa Honigstein's working on a piece. You know, and then when you read Rafa's piece, you think, "Wow, you know, I, I couldn't have, I yeah. couldn't have done that." You know, yeah. with his his contacts and his knowledge of of the Austrian Bundesliga. You know, speaking to a lot of people that worked with with Sadio at a young age, and and gave a fascinating fascinating glimpse into you know the making of the player and the man, really. Mm-hmm. So, um, no, so there's a, there's been a real, you know, there's a kind of a an athletic WhatsApp group with with everyone part, and everyone helps each other out. I think that's the great thing. There's so many brilliant people on board with bulging contacts books going back years and years yeah. that um yeah you know everyone helping helping each other out because you know i think 
obviously it's in everyone's best interest to ensure that the content is as, is as good as it possibly can be. I suppose it's kind of like coming full circle a bit because I remember Tony Barrett talking about his time in the, in the role of the Echo and how you know, when you first, you come up through the ranks and you, you've got the time and you, or you make the efforts to, to go and speak to like the young players and you, you go into the parents of the players and all this, all this kind of stuff because you, you've got that time to grow into the role whereas obviously once you hit the, once you hit the, the big time, you get the big role, it's hard because you're so, you're so busy, you're so flat out whereas I guess it's kind of Given you almost back that time to go back and have a bit, be a bit more considerable, uh, consider things a little bit more, just speak to more of the people that you've built up over the. Over yeah, the year. and you know that's that's been one of the kind of really refreshing things for me so far is you know if you speak to the desk and say you know what, I've, I've actually I'm going to meet four or five people today, but you know I'm not going to file anything. Absolutely, you know, their attitudes are absolutely fine. You know that's yeah. what we want you to do. You know go. Go to the UEFA Youth League game at St Helens on on Wednesday, as I did. You know, don't want a word on it. You know, there's no live blog to write into. There's no match report to write, and you end up, you know, having conversations with kind of three or four agents at half time. You know, making relationships, and it is a bit of a throwback in that respect. You know, I've, I have found myself being able to meet up with with people that you know, realistically, you know, when when you're in that kind of hamster wheel of having to produce five or six things a day, it's it's just not realistic you, really to squeeze to sp- everything in. Spec- it's like speculating to accumulate, isn't it? In, in those instances when you're constantly under the pressure to deliver, it's got to be there, got to be there. You've got to look at things a little bit more coldly, I guess, and say, well, how does this benefit me now? How is this going to benefit the, the thing that I've got to get yeah. out? There's no, there's no sense in, right, in, in spending that time, half, half time talking to someone because realistically, I say you've got, you should, you've got to be tweeting or you've got to be, uh, got to yeah. be writing and what have you. So it, it, again, it, it must feel liberating to be able to be a bit more of a person again yeah yeah it does it does and um you know I, I i certainly feel as if you know i've I've benefited from that so far you know being being you know it's strange in a way because probably in the early weeks you almost felt guilty for yeah. not filing anything you're like yeah. thinking I, I'm, you know because it's almost yeah. that feeling of i should be you know i should be writing something up i should be doing something and then you know you kind of get reassured you know this you know, this is this is part of it this is part of the kind of the um you know the model that the athletic have created we want you to you know we we don't want you to be head buried in a laptop all the time we want you to be out meeting people you know making building the building those relationships cementing the ones you've got already um so yeah it's a bit of a it's a bit of a throwback in in that respect because yeah. you know that was that was certainly kind of what I used to do but you know I think yeah probably over the years just the, the kind of sheer sheer demands and and weight of of, of things you were expected to do that you probably feel as if I, I lost that a bit. And, and I think also the ability to kind of plan a bit in advance because yeah. I certainly felt it was almost like a you know, day-to-day, to, you know, and almost like a, a week-to-week thing where you were in a, a cycle of, you know, you knew that, you know, you had the game on the Sunday, you'd have the mix zone quotes on a Monday to write up, then you might have a press conference on the Tuesday, Champions League Wednesday, you might be off on a Thursday, then you've got Klopp's press conference on a Friday, then you're just back into that yeah. routine. And now because they're not really interested in the press conference stuff unless something earth shattering comes up. It just means that you can just take a step back from that and, and hopefully, you know, pick some topics to go away and, and, and really, you know, work on a, on a piece and, you know, without, being under kind of massive pressure to deliver it, you know, now or within the next hour. It's interesting because we'll, we'll pick up a bit. Hopefully, we've got time later on the on the Brendan Rodgers stuff because I think it's really fascinating. But uh, all this being said, you pretty much in fact you broke the Pedro. Well, it, well, at the time it was the Liverpool field and an eligible player yeah. story. So despite the fact that you don't have the pressures to break <laughs> stuff, you actually managed to be the guy who, who, who was first on on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think news. News is still massively important. I think you know, obviously, a lot of the athletic content is is long, in depth mm-hmm. journalism. But I think, you know, I think everyone knows that that news drives. You know, people want to they they they, they want to know exactly what's going on, and um, so that's still in, an important part of the job. It's not it's not kind of detached completely from from trying to break stories. I think um, you know, and there was you know there was you know in terms of in terms of readers and you know that was probably one of the the highest ones I've actually done so far yeah. um so yeah it was and and again I think that was going back to what we were talking about before that that was a perfect example of of having that extra time to speak to people to to chase things up um and so yeah you know I got got a um a bit of a tip off late late last Friday night that there that there was an issue with one of the Liverpool players that um 
that had featured against MK Dons and and then when you found, then found out of someone else it was surrounding this international transfer certificate where you kind of knew then it could only be one or two it could either be you know Sepp Vandenberg or Pedro Chirivella um, because you know obviously even if even if it's only a loan overseas when they come back to the to the UK to play you still need to get that certificate so um, so yeah managed to obviously get it get it stood up by a couple of different sources and then. We broke that on uh, on Saturday morning. How does I mean? Obviously, you mentioned the the, the international transfer certificates and what have you. But the the question: is, How does a club like Liverpool allow something like this to happen? Because it feels like you expect it in like the lower leagues. And to be fair, obviously, the, the examples that were were cited were, were actually both from Premier League teams. I think in, in West Ham and uh, and Sunderland, similar but not similar but not the same. They were the closest recent examples people could largely find. Is this just a because this is this is not Jurgen Klopp's doing this? You know what I mean? This, no, you know, no, but no. I think people people forget sometimes that there are <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who work behind the scenes of this. But whose whose responsibility is this ultimately? To is this just someone in Chapel Street sat with a with a spreadsheet in front of them or 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 what? Yeah, it's you know, cl- clearly it's an issue on the ad, the admin side of the club. I think it, it's a difficult one because you know obviously. Pedro Chivella was a strange case in point because mm. you know, he went he he went out on loan to was it Extremadura in the Spanish second division in January, but you know issues with paperwork meant he couldn't even couldn't even play for them in the second half of last season. Uh, then he then he came back. Liverpool went through the the correct channels in terms of um, requesting to the FA um, for this international transfer certificate because it is only the national association that can get it. It's not like it's not like Liverpool could have gone to anyone or the Spanish FA and gone, can mm-hmm. we have that certificate? You, you're reliant on the FA. Um, and then subsequently, you know, Ed said, you know, come on, we, we know we need that, that international transfer certificate. Um, clearly where where Liverpool made a mistake was they did not double check before the MK Dons game that, that the FA had, had actually secured that certificate um, and probably assumed that they had done without without checking. So ultimately, the responsibility lay with the club, although I think what helped them when it came to the mitigation was it wasn't if, as if it was a complete and utter oversight. It wasn't like they'd never asked for yeah. it. And, you know, I think... So that probably went in their favour. Obviously, you know, there was the issue that, you know, Sunderland had had four or five years before that resulted in a significant fine. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was, even I spoke to the Football League on uh, on Monday and they were saying then that, um, you know, expulsion was still something under consideration. You know, they said oh, really? essentially there was four options. You know, um, you know, expulsion, uh, making them replay the game, which um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone would have relished another trip to Milton Keynes. <laughs> that, that would have been probably worse than getting, getting chucked for out. One year. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a fine or a warning, and um, so you know, and then, then obviously the football league board met. Um, came up with this two hundred grand fine, with half of it suspended till the end of next season. So, I think in the end, it, it probably felt as if common sense prevailed because I don't, I don't think even you know your most fervent MK Dons fan would argue that Pedro Chirivella <laughs> had a had a huge impact yeah. in knocking them out the League Cup. And and I think the fact that um, you know yes, Liverpool made a mistake; they held their hands up. I think you know their statement you know underlined that they were you know they, they were never going to quibble with. Um, with the, with the penalty that's been imposed on them because it was it, it was a mistake by the club but um, yeah you know not it's it shouldn't have happened but when when you look into it you can see why it did it was it felt because it's interesting you say that because I it, it felt as though that the talk all the talk of expulsion and and the game re- being replayed it felt pr- more like dramatic postulation more than anything else like here's what could here's what could happen but it was very much. Uh, an option on the on yeah the table. yeah yeah. Well, the, the football league as of Monday were still saying that that was you know that that was you know one of the four options open to the board and that they would they would consider all the evidence. I think um, yeah, I think I think the, the 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 mitigation in terms of the fact that Liverpool had you know put in the application initially and then chased it up. Um, that you know that went a long way in their favour in the end. Yeah, I mean, God, imagine. I mean, there's no, you can't see a world where. The you know the DFL are likely to turn down a, a Liverpool Arsenal football match in any way, shape, or form. No, I, I, you wonder whether that probably play, played a little part <laughs> in it as well. And do you know what I was when 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 the, obviously the decision came through about six o'clock before the the Salzburg game. I was I was most pleased for those young players like you know like Harvey Elliott yeah. and Curtis Jones and Kajana Hoover because 
you know, when when I found out about this last Friday night, I was thinking, oh God, you know, you know what that is? That's going to be cruel on them because you know, there's this Liverpool team operating at such a high level. There's not going to be too many opportunities for those kids to a play first team football this season and b play under the lights in front of hopefully be a full house at Anfield. So if they'd been denied that opportunity due to you know a cock up on the admin side, I think that would have been. That would have been incredibly cruel. Well, the irony of it be of, of, of a, a really promising crop of young players being denied this because Liverpool somehow still own Pedro Kidevay. <laughs> is, the, is, is, the, is the case you want to look? No, I've, it, it, it's, it's, it's a fascinating case, isn't he? Because I don't think he's ever had a bad game when he's been given the opportunity to play for Liverpool. He's a very tidy young footballer, isn't he? But, you know, I mean, there was, there was the joke doing the rounds prior to the MK Don games that Liverpool fans are travel. 6,000 people are travelling to pay and paying to watch him play football for, for, <laughs> for the Reds. But, um, no, you you, you, you're dead right. It's it's um it's interesting, isn't it? How the the dynamic uh, I think of supported opinion on the on the League Cup has changed massively in the in the, in the wake of that game because all of a sudden, as you're saying, there people are looking at it and saying, well, I kind of want to see a bit more of Harvey yeah. Elliott and you want to see a bit more of Hoover, etc. And in years gone by, we've treated it as a bit of an annoyance, maybe, or something that's going to distract from bigger, you know, bigger and more important matches. But it represents, and we'll see, of course, how Liverpool approach the, the Arsenal game, but it does represent a, a a completely different opportunity than I think it maybe has done in years gone by. Yeah, and and, and also I think the fact that it's Arsenal in the next round, I, I, I think that will convince Klopp to play a very similar side to the one he put out against MK Dons. Cause I, think, I think Arsenal will put out a pretty young side themselves. Um and it's it's one to really look forward to. I think I think I think you're right. It probably has, that game probably has changed perceptions in terms of you know, before that it was probably just get knocked out as quickly as you can because we've got much bigger fish to fry this season. But then when you see the young players operate at that kind of level, um, you think you know I wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing a bit more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other big one uh, doing the rounds at the moment in, in in the Liverpool world is obviously the the. The, the impending change or not of Liverpool's kit manufacturer uh, for next season. Um, it's rumbled on for, for for a week or so. Nike have, have, have long been rumoured to be in the driving seat for this, James, and it seems to be presenting itself that they are, you know, heir apparent now to the, to, to, to the Liverpool kits. New Balance digging the heels in by by all accounts. The, the reading on this, or the, the, the last update is, it, I guess it's still... With the court, New Balance looking yes. to challenge this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, yeah, broke this over on the Athletic the week, the week before last. In terms of um, the fact that it was it was ending up in the in the High Court, um, and you know what, probably ten days on from from that story, it's still on course to to head to the the High Court. I think it's penciled in for um, October the eighteenth. The, the case is due to start in the in the commercial side of the High Court in London, um, and yeah, it's it's a it's a strange one. Obviously, uh, Liverpool effectively agreed a deal with with Nike. Um, that, you know, clearly Liverpool see that as the the best option for the club um, commercially. Um, but New Balance had this matching clause in their contract, which obviously goes to the end of this current season. Um, and so, and then the process was that obviously Liverpool went out to market, spoke to various different sportswear manufacturers, and then with the best offer, which was the one from Nike, went back to New Balance. Um, New Balance are adamant they have matched it. So as a result of that, it should mean in, in their in their view that they keep the contract. And, um, you know, I know that New Balance have already manufactured three kits for, for, for next season already, you know, whether whether they'll ever see the light of day. Um, we don't know yet, but... Um, I want one of those kits so bad that they're going to be worth a fortune if that, if that happens. The, um, but yeah, it's, you know, and, you know, Liverpool's response to New Balance was obviously, well, no, you haven't matched it because you cannot offer us what, what Nike offer us, which, which and my information is, it, it, it kind of stems around the global distribution. Um, you know, I think you were, uh, I, a lot of the comments I read on the story after I, I did it initially came from Liverpool fans all around the globe, and and quite you know quite a kind of a common theme with people saying, well, yeah, I can understand where Liverpool are coming from because we've got you know I, I can I could I can I could name you six Nike shops nearby. There's no New Balance, yeah. you know. It's and obviously there were issues last season with you know with the kit obviously running out and same with the goalkeeper kit this yeah, season as well. Yeah, so um, I think Liverpool, you know, Nike is just a you know its global presence is is that much bigger. Um, and then obviously subsequently uh, some of the documents 
that are going to be obviously submitted in court have, have emerged, which which shows that kind of the the structure of the deal that Liverpool have have, have kind of put in place with Nike. Initially, there was talk, wasn't there? That, that is the current New Balance deal forty five. Yeah, million. I think I think it goes up to around. It's not it's not a forty five ba- million pound basic. I think there's a lot of because these things obviously there's no real transparency with these things sure. in terms of um, you know you, they, they, you know these contracts aren't published. So I think I think yeah I think people have almost assumed that forty five million pound from New Balance is kind of like there's your check for forty five yeah, million yeah, pound yeah, kind yeah. of thing. It, uh, my information is it, it's not you know it's I think it can go up to forty five million pounds with if various bonuses are, are triggered. Um, Which you'd imagine Liverpool probably have been. Yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah, but you, you, so it, I mean again just to follow the timeline on this, just so so uh, it. it the current, that's roughly what the current deal sits at because yeah. it, it, there's been conflicting reports hasn't there and as you say I guess this is this is where it, it's evolved slightly there was talk initially that the Nike one was around 70 to 75 is that is that right but what's happened since then because because if the, all the talk is that the Barcelona and Real Madrid are near 100 Manchester United would still be would still be more than that with Adidas but now there's talk that Liverpool are, it's actually a lower, I guess like, almost like cash fee almost. And then there's 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 a percentage of sales or whatever. That's yeah, been, that's yeah, been yeah. So, so the, the court documents show that it's, it's effectively a £30 million guaranteed fee. And then Liverpool will get 20% of... Um, of not just kit, not just kit sales, but all Nike LFC products across the globe, um, and obviously Liverpool feel as if with Nike on board, you know those sales will absolutely go through the roof with the the, the greater presence they'll have in yeah. in shops a- across the world. Um, so yeah, the you know the the information I had was that with with all the possible bonuses that could be triggered, uh, and with what Liverpool viewers kind of realistic sales targets that they could, you know, it could rise up to that £70 million pound mark um, in terms of uh, in terms of what it what it's worth to the club over over the course of a year. I mean, even with the other ones that I've mentioned, you know, I've spoke to people at Liverpool who, are, who say, you know, United aren't getting £75 million, pounds, you know, nailed on for their kit deal. You know, yeah. that would be heavily, you know, incentivised and bonus-based and... And, and clearly, you know, I think it's probably safe to assume that United aren't triggering too many, too yeah. many bonuses at the moment. Well, it's, it's ironic, isn't it? Really, when you consider where the Adidas Liverpool split happened, because Liverpool basically weren't offering them value for money in terms of where they were as they were beginning their steady slide into Europa League and at no European football uh, at all. And obviously, Man United are on a, feel, feel like they're on a similar path at the moment. I guess that you know, the, the, Liverpool have become so canny in a business sense. Rightly or wrongly, because we've seen some missteps, particularly in, in recent weeks. But that you, this feels. I mean, uh, to a lay person, that you kind of maybe look a, a bit of scepticism because people like big headline numbers, don't yeah, they? Yeah. But there's clearly someone work. There's an algorithm at work here. Liverpool are looking at existing sales figures and then probably speculating a little touch on top of that because. For me, you know, I, I look at that a, a potential twenty percent of potential sales. When you consider what Nike can bring, that seems like, given where Liverpool are right now, and as, as getting back to being one of the biggest global brands, that could be a, pheno- a phenomenal deal for the club if they get that. Across yeah, that. yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no question about that. I think, uh, and the advantage of that is, you know, a deal like that it means you're not tied into a figure now, which a couple of years down the line, if you know, if if, we, if things go the way we all hope they do, and there's 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 more trophies going into that trophy cabinet, you know. In a couple of years' time, if you'd taken, I don't know, you know, a, a bigger basic fee, then you might be kicking yourself, going, oh, you know, we're not realizing the full potential. I think the benefit of this is, it gives that flexibility for the the figure in terms of what it's bringing into the club to to grow and grow. Obviously, you know, the more successful Liverpool are on the field, the the the, the you know, it, it it's just common sense that they'll sell more and more. Um, night gear, so um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the high court. Um, it's, I think it's penciled in for like a three day, three day case. Kind of, it's, it kind of starts on a Friday, which is a bit, bit bizarre. And then we've got Man United away in the middle of it, and then uh, uh, back for the, for the Monday and the Tuesday um, in court. So, uh, but you know, it's it, obviously you know because there's still the opportunity in the next couple of weeks that it could get sorted out of mm. court. That's still. 
Um, that's still a possible option, although I must, from the people I've spoken to on both sides of the divide, New Balance and at Liverpool, they, they seem pretty sure that you know it's unlikely that that will happen and it, and it will end up being decided in, in a courtroom. It's, it, it feels like slight similarities here. It's funny because it's referenced in the, your, your Brendan Rodgers article of the, of the Arsenal bid for Luis Suarez kind of thing <laughs> where uh, FSG... Ha- they are canny business people, and as much as these these clauses are are, are put in, they don't just put them in blindly. They'll always have ways and uh, of getting around them. I mean, what's the what's your what's your gut feeling on this? Because I can't imagine that's going to be a particularly great working relationship if New Balance somehow come out on on top in this situation. No, I mean, it, I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult, for, you know, having having. Not not read through all the different submissions that from both sides. Well, you've got the time now. To... <laughs> the, um, but I mean, all, all I can say is Liverpool, you know, clearly think they're in a strong position, um, and they they believe that New Balance simply, you know, despite New Balance being adamant they have matched it, that it, they they haven't, and not only haven't they, but they they simply cannot because yeah. they are just not. The, the global force that that Nike are so um you know that that will essentially be what it what it comes down to um in the courtroom I think the fact that it's reached this point kind of just underlines where Liverpool are at now the fact that you've got two two absolute heavyweights like that fighting over um you know the the opportunity to to make the kit when you know it wasn't what was that that, that long ago that um there's uh as you said, those comments from Adidas in terms of you know that Liverpool not providing value and you know the club, you know not being anywhere near kind of the level that they wanted to be associated with, and it just makes you appreciate how much times have changed. Absolutely. Do you, how, how pivotal do you think someone like Peter Moore is to this this kind of thing? Because obviously we've seen Liverpool sign that the exclusive deal with um, FIFA this 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 year as well, and it feels like this is where his absolute forte is because as much as but I think Peter's a bit of an odd, an odd character at times. I think, and, and and his role's a bit. I feels figureheady at times at Liverpool. You know, I'm, I'm sure he's not necessarily. He's not. You know, he's not got his head in the in in the books and in the in the spreadsheets per se. But he is a man who understands the importance of uh, of, the, of brand and the size of your brand and, and, and association and what have you. you know, he, you know, he obviously his, his time working with with Sega and that, and that kind of stuff yeah. and working with EA where. Perception is actually almost as important as as what you've got going on underneath underneath them or behind the curtain. Um, he'll show, he'll understand what it means to have Liverpool and Nike associates and what that means for Liverpool's stature in global sport. Yeah, yeah, he will do, and you know he certainly has has a big part to play. I think in terms of the kit deal per se, you know Billy Hogan has essentially been the driving force mm-hmm. in terms of leading those discussions with with companies, and you know Billy Hogan has has done an amazing job, you know, on the commercial side of the club since he since he's come in. You know, you look in where you know the where Liverpool were at. Um, you know, obviously, it, it kind of you know there there was an upturn under Ian Ebb. Um, sure. You know, on on the back of the the kind of the Hicks and and Gillette debacle, but you know it's been taken to a whole new level under Billy Hogan in terms of you know the the array of of partners uh, across the globe that they've got going on. You know the you know the relationship with Standard Chartered. Um, obviously, you've got the you know you've got the the, the deal with the training kit as well. Um, now you've got this one. You know you've it, it's going to be intriguing. I think probably the next thing that will be a topic of discussion around that will be do they sell the naming rights to the new training ground? Because yeah. um, you know naming rights is it's kind of kind of popped in and out of the conversation a fair bit over the years. You know there was when when Liverpool were redeveloping the main stand, it was. You know, they they made it clear, absolutely abundantly clear, FSG that you know Anfield itself w- was not w- was not going to be uh, kind of auctioned off to the highest bidder. But they were open to the idea of selling naming rights to the main stand. Now they've never found the right partner for that, yeah. um, which you know I think it shows it's not just it's not just about chasing you know as much money as you can possibly get. It's about yeah. getting the the right names on board. Um, but yeah, a naming rights deal for the the training ground. Or, or that you know, I think that's something they'll certainly look at. I'm sure Delta Taxis will be desperate <laughs> for a bit of that, won't they? Um, just a quick reminder then, if you if you're listening to this or you're watching this, that again you can go to theathletic.co.uk forward slash the Red Men TV to get 50 percent off uh, and get access to all those articles that we have been discussing just there with James. Thank you very much to James there for part one. 
part two of this conversation continues over on the redmentv.com where we're going to be talking about the rise and fall of Brendan Rodgers at Liverpool. Here's a little clip of that before you head over and sign up completely free for the first month. It just seemed like a real, just not a clear plan. I remember, I remember Rodgers saying, oh, we're going to go for Wilfred Boney. And like, yeah, we're Boney's the one. And then like kind of two days later, it was, oh, Boney wants 100 grand a week. You know, that's, 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 that's not, so where'd you go for me? Oh, and, then, and then it was like, well, I think we might go for Benzema. And it was like, how do you go from Sanchez to Boney <laughs> to, to Benzema? It yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. and then it was like, you know, is Benzema still a possibility? No, 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 no that's, that's not going to happen yet. And it was, you know, and obviously that was the summer as well with, you know, Loic Remy coming out. I remember being in Boston and <laughs> seeing Loic Remy at the hotel and, you know, he'd had his medical and, and two days, three days later, you, where's the announcement? And then you find out that he'd failed the medical, medical and Liverpool felt it was too much of a gamble. And then... You know, and you, you just, it was just ridiculous to the point where... It makes you understand, knowing that, how Liverpool end up with Balotelli. Yeah, 